welcome everyone back. It was really awesome doing that summer webinar series, um, bringing a lot of new uh, topics and talks uh, to the table, uh, both, both here live on Crowdcast and also on YouTube. Um, it's really, really cool to see the response to that stuff and uh, definitely a lot of uh, positive response and engagement there. So that's, that's why I'm back here uh, talking to you uh, with another series. Um, so we're calling this very creatively the fall webinar series. Um, and we're going to be covering some topics um, really specific to, um, you know, how do we unlock more efficiency and more flavor in brewing um, and uh, ultimately help you become a better brewer. Um, yeah. Just want to confirm that you're able to see me and hear me before we get started. I am recording in a new location, so sometimes that, uh, you know, can cause some challenges. Okay, cool. We've got a confirmation, so I think we'll get going. So welcome to today's talk. Let's focus that. Cool. Uh, we're going to talk about what's in a strain. How does Escarpment Labs or or anyone else make new yeast strains? Um, because there's a lot of yeast development happening, um, a lot of new stuff going on, and uh, I think that there's probably some knowledge gaps. So you know, my goal here is to help you understand what's going on in this wild world of yeast. Why is it moving so fast? Uh, how does all of this work? You know, what is yeast breeding? What is gene editing? What are all these things that are going on that uh, are rolling out seemingly every week from from all the yeast labs, and hoping to help you wrap your head around that so that you can start uh, using these uh, these new yeast strains as tools to improve your brewing. So, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about the current state of brewing yeast. So, you know, where are we starting from? Basically, um, we're going to go into the different methods that can be used to make new yeast strains, uh, which is exciting. You can use methods like yeast crossbreeding, uh, laboratory evolution and uh, certainly gene editing um, using methods like CRISPR-Cas9 has also become quite popular. Uh, we're going to be talking about examples of using those new methods to develop new yeast strains. And then also, of course, how can you apply new, newly developed yeast technologies in your beer? Make your beer tastier, faster, stronger, whatever you want. OK, so I think it's important to frame our conversation around yeast uh, in the context of our other brewing ingredients. So here's question number one. Are we using barley varieties from 50 years ago? The answer is no. Um, we're not using barley varieties from 50 years ago because new varieties have been developed that are agronomically superior, um, you know, that uh, grow at a higher yield. They might be more stress resistant. Uh, they might produce superior traits when they go into the malt house and we get turned into malt. Um, you know, we would have a much less efficient barley production system if we were using malt from, you know, 50 plus years ago. There are still some uh, tradition uh, varieties out there, um, certainly, but um, the vast majority of, especially here in North America, the vast majority of malting barley being grown is, is being grown from relatively recently developed varieties um, like Synergy. So that's something to keep in mind. You know, we're already kind of working with new barley to make our beers. So that leads to the question of how old are our hop varieties? Right? Um, I think you can answer that question. Not very old. Um, I love this graph. Um, I think it comes from, uh, I think from the BA, but it's uh, Hop Growers Association data. And you can really see the evolution of um, different hop varieties in, uh, in North America um, over time um, really change dramatically, right? You can see, for example, left-hand side, Citra is a minor player and becomes the dominant hop. You see the same thing happen with, um, you know, Mosaic rising to prominence as well. Um, so uh, things change really fast. And, you know, the hops that we're using today are not the hops that we were even using 10 years ago. It's evolved extremely fast. You know, increasingly the industry and, and brewers are using um, a lot of very newly developed hop varieties, whether they're public hops or whether they are developed by 
uh, private companies. Um, new hops at the end of the day are, are kind of ruling the show here. So why are we using old yeast strains? Uh, I thought I would put this together. Um, this is basically the three most popular yeast strains that are used in craft brewing today. And none of them have improved very much in decades. Uh, so if we look at those, what are the most popular yeast strains that are used in craft beer? Uh, Cali Chico strain is extremely popular. You know, it's it, it established itself quite well in the 1980s uh, with Sierra Nevada, other brewers uh, on the West Coast of the U.S. Um, and became, you know, one of the absolute most dominant strains in the craft beer industry because it can make beer that's clean, it's fast, it's easy to use. It is a great yeast for making, you know, West Coast IPAs and, you know, pretty much any other clean beer style. So there's a reason it's popular. That being said, it has not changed much in the last 40 years. Another strain that is now, you know, quite possibly the most popular out there is your, uh, we call Fungi London Ale. You might hear similar strains called London 3 or, or something else. Um, this really is the hazy strain. Where does it come from? It actually comes from uh, a brewery depositing this strain in the UK's National Collection of Yeast Cultures. Um, in the 1970s, and uh, most most variants of this strain have not really evolved very much since then. So that's uh, that's 50 years. Um, what's the benefit of this strain? Yeah, it's a nice strain, but the main benefit is a, that it's haze positive. If you use it in your beer, your beer will turn out hazy. It's easier to get that stable haze that is uh, desired in hazy IPAs, New England IPAs, um, than a lot of other yeast strains. And so that's that's the benefit of that strain. So. Um, it's extremely popular because of one trait, because of haze, in my opinion. Um, great strain, nothing against it, but you know there are other options out there, but it's remained popular because of that haze stability. And then we get into the lager world, that's you know even more dominant. If you look globally, you know some version of 3470 probably is used to ferment more than 50% of the beer in the world, would be my just my guess. Uh, extremely dominant yeast. Um, and there are variants of it, like uh, Isar Lager, that are that are that are that have some different uh, phenotypic traits, whether that's lower sulfur, um, lower diacetyl, etc. Um, but that that yeast has not really changed that much since the 1950s. Um, you know, it was uh, it, it usurped another yeast strain that was quite popular um, because of some difficulties with malt, and it basically stayed the dominant strain for making lagers ever since. Uh, what are the benefits of it? Um, kind of the same as the Cali. It's clean. It's fast. It's easy to use. Uh, it actually has low nutrient requirements as well, so that gives that strain a nice benefit as well. But stands to stands to reason that uh, there's probably some room for improvement if we haven't changed that strain in 70 years, right? Um, because the technologies that are used to develop new barley varieties, new hop varieties, all of this is actually easier in yeast. Like it takes a couple months to develop a new yeast strain. Whereas if you want to develop a new barley line or a new hop line, it might take 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of opportunity for us, uh, I think. So this is sort of the starting point for our own story with the Scarpman Labs. Um, back in 2019, 2018, we did a lot of work to characterize a lot of our existing beer yeast strains, because we have a collection of uh, yeast strains that we found from all over the place, whether that's bottles of beer, uh, commercial yeast isolates, um, uh, traditional brewing like Kvike, like, you know, we had this collection and we wanted to know, you know, what can it do? So this was kind of our starting point of what is out there in terms of the status quo that we can access with flavor. So this graph is what I call a flavor map. It's, you know, in technical terms, it's called a PCA, but basically what you need to know is strains that appear close together have a similar flavor profile in terms of the flavor uh, molecules they make. Um, and in this map, strains that are towards the left end, the left side and the bottom of the graph uh, tend to be more neutral, whereas strains that are towards the right and towards the top uh, tend to be more expressive. So there's uh, flavor molecules corresponding to esters that are fruity or biotransformation, uh, terpene biotransformation. Um, that push some of those aromatic strains to the right and to the top. And so right away, this is one of the gaps that we saw is like, wow, there's actually not a lot of strains that can give you fruity esters and hop biotransformation. Isn't that interesting? I wonder if we could start working on developing something for that. And uh, likewise, you know, there's, there's actually, you know, a little bit of room to develop in 
uh, that sort of bottom right quadrant as well, which I'll call like the Saison area, you know, you get enormous flavor diversity there and there's, there's definitely room to play and explore there. So this was sort of our starting point of, uh, you know, where do our different yeasts sit on the flavor map and how could we uh, use that data to start intentionally developing new, new yeast strains um, based on, based on um, some of these existing ones using different methods. And we're going to get into those methods. We're going to talk about the future yeast in four different parts, and these pictures are hopefully going to make sense uh, once once we're done here. Okay, so first one we're going to talk about is bioprospecting as a source for new yeast flavor efficiency and yeast diversity. Um, that's the prospector. It's also my favorite Christmas movie. I really look forward to watching it next month. Hope you do too. Uh, Bioprospecting is, uh, really put simply, is going out and finding wild yeast. Um, and wild yeast is everywhere. It's uh, mostly found around uh, sources of sugar, which tends to be things like fruit, tree bark, soil, um, tend to be hotbeds. So you don't necessarily want to go out into a, into a forest and just leave your agar plate out sitting and hoping that a wild yeast lands on it, uh, like that picture on the left. But uh, you certainly can try, but you can go out in the wild and... Uh, collect samples and take them back to the lab and try to isolate yeast off them. And sometimes you might find something really cool. So, you know, one really amazing example of bioprospecting was there were some scientists that were curious about these mushrooms growing on beech trees in South America, in Patagonia, so in the mountains in, in Argentina. And uh, they happened to find a yeast on one of those mushrooms and sequenced it up and said, this is a new yeast. That's interesting. Wonder what it is. Um, and then later found out that uh, this new yeast they found, uh, it's called Saccharomyces eubianus, and it actually solved a uh, one of the biggest mysteries in brewing science. Um, I talked about already lager yeast is so dominant worldwide in beer production. Uh, lager yeast is, is the thing that makes it special is it, it is a hybrid. It's a hybrid of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, ale yeast, and something else. We didn't know until uh, this other yeast was found, and, and it was basically a perfect match. You know, this Saccharomyces eubianus, originally found on a mushroom in Patagonia, was, was the perfect match for the other parent of lager yeast. And the genetic contribution from eubianus uh, is what gives lager yeast its cold tolerance and some of the other beneficial traits. Um, so did a strain of yeast from Patagonia go and somehow get to a cellar in Bavaria and create lager yeast? Probably not. We've actually since found uh, Saccharomyces eubianus in a lot of different places around the world. Uh, and there's still a big, you know, a new mystery of where did the lager parent Saccharomyces eubianus come from? Uh, maybe in a forest that disappeared 500 years ago. Who knows? But that's a great example of going out into the wild. And, you know, you can actually find some really, really um, valuable stuff um, for the beer industry. And, you know, there's an example right there where Heineken um, licensed it. I think they licensed it, that strain and made a beer with it. And it sounds like it was a, a huge challenge because that is a that is a wild yeast that, that isn't necessarily used to fermenting beer, but uh, they got it done and, and had a really cool story around that. So some examples from our own lab. I'm just gonna like move my face for a second here. Great. Um, yeah, some examples from our own lab where we've done this. You can, you know, this is the easiest way to develop a new yeast strain almost is to uh, go out into the wild and uh, use some some simple microbiology techniques to enrich for yeast and then isolate it. So two examples I'll talk about are lactic magic, which is a, it's non-saccharomyces. It's a Lachancia thermotolerance yeast, which is uh, known for the ability to produce lactic acid, which is not normal for most yeasts. Um, so this strain can produce lactic acid. Um, we actually isolated that from a tree. So from a eastern white cedar tree um, into the lab and then discovered it was this species. And we, we really liked its ability to produce lactic acid in the flavor profile. So we were able to uh, take that strain to market. And then another one that I'll talk about is a strain called uh, Ney. So um, that's become quite popular for non-alcoholic beers. So that is a Maltotriose negative yeast. So that's a yeast that is not capable of fermenting um, malt sugars beyond the simple sugars like glucose and fructose. Um, so, you know, ordinarily for a normal beer, that wouldn't be very exciting. But in the context of non alcoholic beer, it is very exciting because 
one uh, major way to produce non-alcoholic beers is to uh, utilize a, non, a sorry a maltose negative yeast, which which won't ferment very many of the sugars, um, and so consequently it's able to um, produce a low alcohol beer. Um, and that yeast was isolated from some spontaneously fermenting crab apples. Um, so you know you never know what you're going to find when you find fermentation in the wild, and it's it's always worth taking a look. And you can you can develop some really really interesting yeasts from there. So. Moving forward from bioprospecting, we're going to get further into the lab here. We have hybrid yeast. So hybrid yeast, otherwise known as yeast breeding, is when you take two different yeast strains and you use lab methods to produce a brand new hybrid. So that's not a blend. That is a hybrid. It, it is, you know, you're taking two strains and basically turning them into one single strain. Um, and, and then sometimes you can get the benefits of both of those strains or even completely different results. This is how a lot of uh, you know barley varieties are created. How a lot of hop varieties are created. It's through it's through crossbreeding and then selecting and screening um, those uh, progeny, those those new strains. Um, and I also think it's fun because uh, this process of two different strains um, that have two different mating types, and that's how this works. You have two different strains, two different mating types. They exchange pheromones. They do what's called schmooing, which is you know this process where the cells kind of extend out and touch each other. Uh, which is straight up just named after this cartoon. Um, so, you know, yeast scientists are are uh, pretty creative, I think. Uh, literally just named after this weird weird shaped cartoon, the schmoo. I didn't know about this until I actually learned about yeast breeding and yeast genetics. Anyway, you have these two strains with opposite mating types, which is kind of like uh, sex chromosomes or something like that. It would be the equivalent for mammals. And then they fuse and you end up with a hybrid strain. Um, and then that will have genetic material from both parents. Um, so just a, a further illustration of that, you have basically exchange of mating factors or pheromones. Uh, so, you know, just, just like humans, you know, yeast, they, you know, dim the lights and put on some, put on some slow jams and, and get down to it. They exchange their pheromones, they mate, and you've got a new cell. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, surprisingly a similar process, although, uh, with yeast, it's a little bit a little bit more simple. Um, and at the end of the day, with with yeast, we can um, make a new yeast strain through breeding in in a matter of a couple of days. So what's an example? Uh, example that I will use. Bring myself back here. Uh, example that I will use is our Thiolibre. So uh, that's the strain that was produced through yeast breeding. So. Uh, we wanted to have a strain that was good at releasing uh, thiol aromas. And we've talked about this. Uh, you can go and check out our videos on biotransformation. Um, but to give a background of how that was made, we took, you know, we wanted a, a yeast strain that could do a good job at beer fermentation, but also release thiols. Um, most beer strains are not very good at that. So we, we, looked, we looked to what could we use. And we actually found a, uh, a wild strain that had really, really good thiol release potential. Um, but otherwise was really, really bad for making beer. So we bred that with a, in this case, a Kvike strain. Also actually had pretty good thiol release um, abilities, um, but also some other beneficial traits we were looking for. We were looking for ester production, um, good attenuation, fast fermentation rate, et cetera. So we were able to use yeast breeding techniques to cross those two and create thiol libre. So that's a single strain that retains traits from both of its parents. So it has good thiol release. It has uh, good ester production, especially that like pineapple ester. It's really nice, uh, as well as um, the beneficial uh, fermentation characteristics of Kvike, as well as uh, one of the things that we found with this strain that's really beneficial as well is it's got a normal fishing th finishing pH where some of the Kvikes um, tend to be a little bit acidic. Um, and here's an example. So um, we, were, we were lucky to collaborate with some of the uh, local breweries here in Ontario, left field town, Dominion City, um, recently to test out uh, this strain and, uh, you know, just, just help help give uh, more people opportunity to taste it. So um, while the Thio Libre strain is often used in IPAs, hazy IPAs, um, this is just a Blondale. And I think it's a really actually great example to talk about because um, with a yeast strain that's ex so expressive like that, you can get some really fascinating results with a very simple recipe. So this was a very simple malt bill. Um, I think it only used cascade hops for the hopping and a little bit of phantasm powder. Um, so really making a more light beer, but featuring that uh, really strong aroma from the yeast, that uh, guava, white wine, 
uh, kind of characteristic from the yeast style release um, to make something really, really tasty. So, you know, I, I think it definitely punched above its weight aromatically at four at four point seven percent. So if you do see that beer anywhere out there, make sure to try it out because I think it's pretty tasty. And it's important to make sure that we clarify hybrids versus blends. Um, yeah, I, I love those Will It Blend videos. Um, yeah, because these are different things. And I think they're often confused and it's important to clarify, you know, what do we mean by these? So hybrids are stable. It's one strain. It's one strain that's been generated from two parents, whereas a blend is two or more strains that are blended together. So you might propagate them separately blend them together into one package and then pitch that. So blends can be good, but they have some drawbacks. They're not stable when you repitch them because if one yeast strain in that mix has a faster growth rate, it's going to it's going to basically take over. Um, so that then means that you might not have as much flavor consistency or stability. Um, with hybrids, you you know, yes, there's multiple genetic backgrounds, but it's one strain, so it will be a lot more stable. Um, and in terms of um, yeast product development. Um, obviously, blends are easy. You can take two of any strains, throw them together, you're good to go. You got a new yeast blend. Um, whereas uh, developing hybrids is more work. So that's that's one of the trade-offs here is that it's more work to develop hybrids, but uh, oftentimes um, the results you get are better, especially if you're repitching the yeast. And we've been hard at work developing a lot of different hybrids. I think it's a great method to develop new yeast strains that have new um combinations of properties that that um perhaps beer strains did not previously have so uh the first example that we released was Jotun, which is a um we like to treat it as like a saison belgian yeast um, but one of the cool tricks of that one is that it's actually flocculent where most um saison strains have very very poor flocculations so um for certain circumstances like repitching for example top cropping uh, it makes things a lot easier. It also has quite a nice aroma profile. Um, and then Hydra, which has been uh, quite a successful hybrid. Um, we crossed two of the most popular IPA strains, Vermont and Cerberus, or otherwise known as Sacroix. And we uh, created this new strain called Hy Hydra. Um, what was kind of interesting about it is that, you know, Vermont is a pretty high attenuation strain. Cerberus is, is also, and that's because it's diastatic, STA1 positive. This hybrid is actually lower attenuation than both parents, but um, with with some of the hazy IPAs, especially with lower um, strength, lower gravity hazy IPAs, having that residual sugar and residual body in the beer can really, really help balance it out. Um, so we found that a lot of brewers really like that lower attenuation. Um, plus, this strain has really strong fruity characteristics. It's one that we've targeted to um, both have strong ester production and also have strong um, biotransformation properties because, you know, combination of those two things wasn't so common out there, especially in a um, IPA strain. So this strain can can give you some nice esters um, and some nice terpene biotransformation. And when you combine it with the right hops, you can get a really nice profile. You know, if we combine Hydra with Strata hops, for example, it always goes to a really nice kind of mango profile. So try that out. Um, and then Thialibre, which we talked about, but that's another great example of a hybrid yeast uh, developed for a specific purpose to release um, the tropical thiols and, uh, and, and give you another option for that kind of uh, thiol release flavor profile. And even more. So we've been really hard at work developing new hybrids. We've got two new ones that you can buy now. Um, as a brewer, I, I believe they're also coming out uh, very soon on uh, homebrew as well. Um, Elysium and Pomona. So these are two brand new strains. These are the first strains to graduate from our experimental strain program, where we're having uh, lots of brewers test out new yeast strains while they have basically strain numbers. So it's really, really similar to how hop um, variety development works, where you know you have a variety with a number, and um, brewers get a chance to try it out, provide feedback, and then and then we'll launch it with a uh, brand name. Uh, so Elysium is a, is a really cool strain um, that's produced through breeding. Um, and one of the highlights of that strain is that it has a really strong pineapple ester, but it also has good flocculation um, and a pretty dynamic attenuation range. So you can use it. Uh, honestly, I think it works great in West Coast IPAs. You can use it to ferment sours. You can use it to ferment even like a, like simple beers, Blondale, uh, et cetera. Um, it can do a whole lot. Um, it's really, really versatile strain. 
Um, brewers making like high grav, triple IPAs, all sorts of things with it. Um, so a lot of potential there. And then also Pomona. Um, there's a lot of interest in this one. And part of it is that this is a new, um, a new, a new haze positive strain. So there's not a whole lot of haze positive IPA strains out there. Um, and this is a new option. So, you know, we've talked about how the foggy London is so popular. Um, this is another option that you can try out. So, um, it has, uh, it was developed through breeding. So we, we took two strains that we really like. we bred them together to make a new one. Um, and we found that when we did that, we got a, a pretty nice profile. Um, but that it needed some improvements in efficiency when it was fermenting IPAs. So we actually took it in and evolved it in IPA wort. And we're going to get into lab evolution next. So you'll know what I mean. But basically, this is the yeast that was bred, bred and then adapted to IPA production. So you get a haze positive yeast that has a really nice flavor profile. We were getting a lot of uh, testers noting a, a peach ester kind of profile, um, plus uh, some nice other you know mixed flavors, berry, grape. Pine, um, all sorts of nice stuff. Um, really, really compelling option for IPAs, I think, especially if you're um, getting bored with the same old strains. Which brings us to adaptive lab evolution. And uh, as always, I found a way to work this GIF into a slide. Um, it's probably like the fourth time that I've done this. I'm sorry. Uh, I love Jurassic Park. Okay, lab evolution. How does that work? So here's, <laughs> here's a graph. Um, this looks complicated. It's actually quite simple if you're a brewer and you've never done any repitching. It's basically you're repitching or repropagating the same yeast over and over and over again until it changes. Um, so you can sort of see that illustrated here at the top. You're starting with a culture and then you're applying some kind of selective pressure. Maybe it's temperature, maybe it's uh, something that's in that fermentation environment that's inhibitory. Maybe it's sugar content, alcohol, some kind of selective pressure. And over time, you will get random mutations that give those cells a benefit uh, in this environment. And they start to outcompete the other cells. And so by the time you get to the end, you might have strains that have accumulated multiple different mutations that are beneficial in that environment. And then you can go and you can select those individual winning mutants um, and you can then test them out compared to the original and see if, um, if you've obtained a, a better strain. Um, so you can sort of see that uh, in the bottom left as well. Your, your starting strain um, might evolve once and, and gain some fitness advantage, and then you might even see multiple evolutions that give it a stronger fitness advantage. And then what we can do is we can then take that evolved strain, we can do uh, whole genome sequencing, and we can find out what changed. So uh, which genes actually changed, and then try to look for an explanation of um, what uh, what did we what did we do that made this strain better? Because then you can actually go and reproduce that without having to, you know, guess. So this is a bit of a fishing expedition, but it's a it's an effective way if if we know that there's a way there's there's a selective pressure that we want our yeast to perform better under, we can apply that and we can try to adapt that yeast uh, to uh, improve in that environment. So you know, a great example is high alcohol. You can do lab evolution to evolve a yeast strain to tolerate higher amounts of alcohol, which is actually great for a trait in the yeast that depends on a lot of different genes like alcohol tolerance. You know, you can't just go in and change one gene and the yeast will magically have a higher alcohol tolerance. It does depend on, on several different genes. So this is a great approach for those kinds of situations. If you're looking at something like thiols, where it's really just like one gene, um, this might not be the best approach. So here's how it works for us. We've done a number of these kinds of projects with lab evolution. Um, we'll do the experiment that can be several weeks or several months. It can go for a long time. Uh, we'll try to isolate new variants. So you can see an example here where we were trying to um, get a yeast to grow better on malt sugars. So we, we plated it onto agar with maltose to see which, which colonies grew faster. Um, and then we'll take it up to lab scale fermentations. So, you know, how does the new evolved strain actually compare to the original one? And then if it shows favor there, then we'll scale it up. We'll do some homebrew trials and see, you know, at a semi semi uh, commercial operational environment, how does that yeast strain fare? How does it taste? And then if it's uh, still looking really good, we'll start sending it, that out to breweries in the experimental strain program. So one example we'll use here is uh, how we got to our current version of Crispy, which is a kvike yeast that's used for 
uh, clean beers. So it's a really, really nice uh, clean strain of Kvike uh, suited to those pseudo lagers or, or light ales and just maximizing efficiency. So um, especially if you bump up the pitch rate on this strain, you can get some really, really fast and clean ferments. So it's not a traditional lager, but if you need to make clean beer fast, it's definitely the way to go. Um, but the original version of Crispy had some drawbacks. It had lower attenuation than a typical lager yeast did, and it was also a blend. So as we talked about, blends are not the best to work with because they tend to not be stable. So that was one of the challenges, is that if it was repitched, sometimes uh, it would um, vary in its properties. So we put it through lab evolution. This is just an illustration of what we did. Um, we basically said, okay, we want the attenuation to be better. We picked you know, one of the two strains that we thought had a better starting flavor profile for what we were targeting, that like very, very clean pseudo lager. And we put it through, uh, basically through the gauntlet. Uh, we started uh, uh, fermenting it in, uh, in 17 Plato warts, so kind of on the middle end of the gravity range, and then stepped it up over time to 24 degrees Plato, so decidedly high gravity and uh, ran that for 97 days or 55 repitches. So, you know, a fair bit of time. Um, this looks complicated, but it's basically what goes on in, in the brewery or, you know, if you're repitching. You know, if you're repitching, you're doing a fermentation, you're collecting the yeast, you're putting it into the next batch. It's the exact same process. And if you see your yeast change when you're repitching, this is what's going on. You're often seeing some evolution in the brewery. You know, there are some uh, studies being done showing some, you know, measurable yeast evolution, genetic changes happening in as little as uh, 10 to 15 generations. So here, if we're going 55, we can expect that we'll see some changes. So um, I know that what I originally explained looked like looked complicated, but at the end of the day, it's just basically repitching and measuring how does the yeast change. Um, so for us, with that project, it worked out quite well. We were able to get a yeast strain with better attenuation um, and that had either better flavor or equivalent flavor. Um, and then roll that out to breweries who are who are using it to make their beers. So it's qu quite a popular strain, um, especially for home brewing. Um, and that's because you can make a clean beer in like less than a week, um, which I think is you know certainly exciting sometimes. Um, so we have brewers that are making these beers in you know one week, two week, um, able to make a nice clean light beer, lager, whatever you want to call it. And another example would be uh, using lab evolution to improve terpene biotransformation. So this is another case where we don't really fully understand on a genetic level how the yeast terpene biotransformation works. We've talked a lot about it, but we don't know exactly like what genes control this. So, but there's a lot of potential. You know, we if we improve hop terpene biotransformation, you can take hops that are you know floral and make them a lot more citrusy, which I think is compelling. People tend to prefer citrus over floral in uh, in beer. Uh, you can extend the shelf life of the beer if you're able to push more of those uh, terpenes, which are which are survivable compounds. They will stick around in the beer um, and enhance the flavor profile. And you can, uh, you know, if, especially if you're on the commercial side, if you've got hops that you don't quite like, but you're stuck with, you know, you've contracted them. Leveraging terpene biotransformation is a great way to adjust the flavor profile and make it work for you. And even just playing around with different yeast strains and the same hops might yield some really, really great results in terms of um, improving or altering the flavor of those hops. But one of the challenges is that this is not well understood on a genetic basis. So it's a great candidate for lab evolution. We don't know, we can't just go and turn on one gene or turn off another. We have to do some, uh, a bit of a fishing expedition here and uh, do a lab evolution experiment to see if we can actually improve this trait in the yeast. So in this case, we did that. Um, we used linalools, which is one of the terpene compounds as selection pressure, and basically exposed the yeast to a toxic concentration of it, you know, with the idea being that maybe we can enhance the metabolism of the terpenes overall and, uh, you know, basically make some modifications to that pathway, whether that increases terpene production or decreases it. We don't know, but let's try. Um, so we did it. Um, in this case, 120 days and 47 serial dilutions. So Again, that's like 47 repitches. Um, it's quite a lot, but you can see some measurable results. So for example, here at the um, graph on the right, um, the evolved populations that we uh, generated grew faster in that environment. So they had learned how to, or evolved to um, grow faster, grow better under that toxic concentration of 
little. What does that mean in the beer? Luckily for us, it actually worked. Um, we did get measurable increases in terpene production. So uh, the beta citronella, which is uh, our typical measure for terpene biotransformation, because it's not typically found um, naturally in hops. It has to be produced by yeast uh, from other terpenes. Uh, we saw an increase in these evolved uh, variants. So uh, up to about 39% um, increased production of beta citronella, which is great. You know, if you're getting 39% more citrus aroma out of your hops, I think that's, uh, you know, and all you have to do is evolve the yeast or change the yeast strain. I think that's a, that's a pretty nice trade-off. Um, and so we also did do some sensory scale testing uh, internally, made some beers and had um, people taste them and provide sensory feedback and, uh, you know, got some interesting uh, results there. So, you know, we were getting citrus coming up a lot. Um, interestingly enough, we were also getting um, banana and bubble gum coming up a lot. So that's one of the, depending on how you look at it, one of the challenges or the drawbacks of lab evolution is that sometimes you evolve a trait that you didn't expect. Um, so in this case, this strain, and, you know, we went and, and okay, tasters are noting banana, what's going on here? We went and looked at that um, that molecular data, what, what flavor molecules are being made. And we actually saw an increase also in the isobutyl acetate, which is an ester that, that does give you that, you know, depending on who you are, you might call it banana, you might call it bubble gum. Um, it is, a, it is a, a common ester produced by different yeast strains. It's, it's quite common in, in some of the Belgian yeast strains, especially. Um, but in addition to evolving terpene production, we also did evolve uh, more of this. So um, that's quite interesting. Uh, if you want a yeast strain that can, you know, produce more citrus, but also produce more of those, um, you know, banana bubblegum notes, um, that might be compelling. And, and that is a strain that we're currently testing with um, with testers in the experimental strain program. Um, I don't personally find it to be super banana-y. It just, you know, I think it can mesh really, really well with dry hops and things like that. Um, and certainly the enhanced citrus is really, really nice for shelf life. Um, so that highlights one of the benefits of adaptive lab evolution. You can improve yeast strains when you don't know what genetic pieces, what genes you need to change. Um, and you can do that with terpene biotransformation. But sometimes when you do that, you get, uh, you get, diff you know, you get additional changes on the side, right? You didn't target a specific gene. You didn't target a specific change. You just gave the yeast a stress and waited for um, mutations to occur that gave it a fitness advantage. So in this case, you know, we evolved terpene transformation, but also banana ester production. And, you know, we didn't really expect that. And that does bring us to gene editing, which I think is quite a popular topic. And I also think there's a lot of um, confusion around it. So I'm hoping to help demystify that. Um, that's supposed to be a GIF, you know, where the kid gives the thumbs up. But that's basically it. That's the promise of gene editing is it's basically copy and paste, but for genes. Um, in practice, it's a little bit more complicated, but it is um, surprisingly simple, actually. So. What is gene editing? How does it work? Um, there's gonna be way better videos on YouTube explaining this process, but I'm gonna give a brief overview. So say we have a yeast gene that we want to inactivate, and I'll use the example of the genes that make phenolic flavor. So those are uh, a gene called um, ferulic acid decarboxylase, FDC1. If you have an active version of that gene in the yeast, it has that um, phenol that makes the beer taste Belgian. If you have an inactivated version of that gene in the yeast, it doesn't produce that phenol. So that tends to be the yeast that are used for non-Belgian beers, you know, your British beers, your American beers, etc. It's a key difference between yeast strains um, because that phenol aroma is, is, so, is so distinctive and it does drive our own perceptions um, of that beer in different directions, right? It tells us this is like a Belgian beer or a Hefeweizen, or it tells us this is like an IPA, right? So it is pretty critical. Um, so CRISPR or CRISPR-Cas9 gives you the ability to, you know, reproduce those kinds of, you know, mutations, whether that's naturally occurring, or you can even take any genetic material and put it into a, a yeast genome. So how does it work? You have this thing called a guide RNA um, that you've basically put into the yeast cell. 
that tells this enzyme called Cas9 that you're also in this case, you know, putting into and expressing in the yeast cell. Guide RNA is telling Cas9, go here and cut. That's basically how that works. It's, it does get a lot more complicated, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to keep it at go here and cut. Uh, so guide RNA tells Cas9 where to go. Cas9 goes, goes to where it's supposed to go and then cuts uh, the DNA at that point. So now you have two fragments of DNA. So it's not actually going to work. It's broken. So then in the case of yeast, we can make use of the yeast natural uh, DNA repair mechanisms. And if we provide a template that that yeast can use to fix that break, it will. It'll basically take that and say, great, thank you, paste. And uh, now you've got a new uh, yeast, uh, a new, sorry, a new, a new piece of genetic material in your yeast's, um, in your yeast's genome. Um, so that could be, you know, a small fragment to break that uh, phenol producing gene. It also could be you're going to put in a whole new gene um, to give the yeast a new function, right? Like one example would be you could put in a functional version of the IRC7 gene that, that helps yeast make uh, release thiols. You can put in a, a functional version of that into a yeast strain that doesn't have it. And now you've improved its ability to produce thiol aromas. And you can do that in pretty much any yeast strain. Uh, so the benefits of gene editing is that it's precise. You can basically change, you know, one single letter in that 12 million uh, letter yeast genome if you want to. It's stable um, if you're making changes and, uh, you know, you can typically get fairly stable um, edits, which then means, you know, on, on the brewing side, that's great because you're going to get repeatable results. Um, and then if you know what you're changing, this is a very sim simple system. You can design your guide RNA, design your repair template to target, um, you know, some site that you want to change in the yeast and plug it in. It's basically copy and paste. Um, but one of the drawbacks is that it's not perfect. So um, this system, this enzyme will sometimes cut or produce changes in places that we didn't intend. So those are called off-target effects. Um, so if you are doing this kind of work, you do have to check to see, you know, did we change something else in the yeast? Um, and the other part is we can't CRISPR what we don't know, right? If we don't know how terpene production works, CRISPR is not helpful to us. We have to go and discover and do the basic research to find out how some of these things work in the yeast before we can actually um, use this technology in some cases. But yeah, at its most basic, it is basically Control-C, Control-V. There's two different things we can do with gene editing um, or two different categories of gene edits that I think is also important to talk about because both are being used in the beer industry right now. Um, so the first is what's called transgenic. So when you think of like gene editing GMOs, like this is probably what you're thinking of. And that's where we're taking genetic code from an unrelated organism and putting it in the yeast strain. So um, one example would be we could take a gene from mold, aspergillus, put it into the yeast. And that's actually been done. Um, there's a yeast uh, available in the U.S. called Sour Vissier, um, that has that enzyme, um, lactate dehydrogenase, that's, that's put into the yeast so that it can make lactic acid. So that's kind of cool. You've got a yeast that can make sour beer. Um, whereas uh, there's also the other side is cisgenic edits. So you're taking genetic code from one strain of the same, the same organism, same genus species and you're replicating it in just another strain. So uh, one example could be you're taking a gene from one yeast strain and copying it into another. So one example would be taking a Belgian strain and removing that phenolic off flavor um, by reproducing that naturally occurring loss of function mutation. So you can take a strain that would normally taste Belgian, just change that one single letter, inactivate that gene, and all of a sudden you have a yeast that tastes completely different because it's not producing that spicy phenol. Um, so, you know, in this case, it, it literally is apples into apples, right? Um, to illustrate that point, like you're taking a gene from one type of apple and you're putting it into another type of apple. That's cisgenic editing. So um, here in Canada, we have a lot more of that on the market. Whereas uh, if you look at the U.S., there's there's both. And, uh, you know, there are some regulatory frameworks around these. I'm I'm not the expert in the U.S. side, but we've been through the process in Canada. So. Here in Canada, we have a process to get these kinds of newly developed yeast strains approved. Um, so one example is called the non-novel food determination. So just wanted to provide some examples. I know this stuff isn't that exciting, but you know uh, the Thiolibre um, and um, 
cosmic punch or, uh, from omega yeast are, are two examples of yeast that have been through that process. And it is important to have a, a regulatory screening process to make sure that you know any newly developed uh, yeast strains with with these kinds of technologies are um, you know the due diligence is done to ensure that it's that it's safe because when especially when you're getting into like transgenic edits you have to make sure that whatever new function is that's being added to the yeast is is going to ensure that it has the same safety profile as um, the original strain. And there are other options out there. I, you know, I, I want to highlight some of the other options. There's some, there's some cool strains out there um, that are products of yeast breeding or um, bioprospecting, gene editing. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not just escarpment labs. There's, there's some other options out there. Um, and honestly, it's, it's just heating up now. And I think we're um, going to see a, a real renaissance in um, new development of, of um, brewing strains. Um, it's going to be really, really interesting. I know we've got a lot of, um, a lot of cool stuff on the way and, I, and I'm sure that's um, coming to market from, from other providers as well. So if you're a brewer that's excited about yeast, excited about trying new yeast strains, um, it's going to be, it's going to be a great time for you. And there's a lot of possibilities. So I just wanted to collect a few here um, on that sort of gene editing or um, what's also called bioengineering side. And these are examples that are just, just from published research. So none of this is top secret. This is just stuff that's already been done in scientific studies that could be applied in the brewing industry. So you could use gene editing to remove phenolic off flavor from any strain or add it in if you really wanted to. Um, so you could take a, uh, you can, and there's some of these on the market, you can take a Hefeweizen strain, take the clove out, get just the banana. Um, you can boost or reduce esters. So if you really, really like the banana ester, you can increase it. If you really, really hate it, you can inactivate it. Um, you can reduce VDK formation. So there's both transgenic and cisgenic ways to get that done. But if you really hate diacetyl, um, there are some solutions that will help reduce that risk. Um, you can boost thiol release. So you know there's a few different yeasts on the market that can that can help with that already. Um, you know, based on some of these uh, ideas from scientific studies. Um, you can remove STA1. So if you've got a yeast that's diastatic and um, it's wreaking havoc in your brewery because it's getting into the other beers and making your cans explode, um, you can fix that. And so, you know, I think that com combining a, a yeast that has STA1 removed and just using um, glucoamylase enzyme that you can just, you know, buy in a jug for, 30 or 40 bucks is going to be a lot safer than a yeast strain that's basically a glucoamylase factory, right? So you have some new opportunities to um, reduce the risk if you're if you're producing uh, yeast with with diastatic um, yeast, so producing beer with diastatic yeast like saisons. And you can also enhance flocculation. So that's another thing that can be done if you you know want yeast to be more flocculent, less flocculent. Um, those possibilities are out there. Um, so we're, we'll probably see. Uh, some of these ideas, um, you know, continue to to come to market and become available to brewers. So that's the future of yeast. Hopefully, these pictures make sense now. We've got bioprospecting, which you can't overlook. It's it's almost the simplest approach, but you can find some really really interesting yeasts. We have breeding and hybridization, which is a great way to combine two two yeast strains or more and um, get something greater than some of its parts or get new yeast strains. We have lab evolution, which is a great way to um, improve traits in a yeast if we don't know exactly what we need to change. And we have gene editing for when we do, if we know exactly what we need to change in order to get a new result or a new uh, uh, changed trait in the yeast, whether that's flavor, flocculation, uh, gene editing is a great tool for that. So that brings us to the end of this webinar. Um, make sure to ask some questions uh, afterwards and I'll be happy to answer them. Um, in the meantime, also make sure that you uh, check out our knowledge base. Um, we've got more than 80 entries in there with very, very uh, good information about um, how to use our yeast strains. Our YouTube has lots of content. We're going to keep adding these webinars to our YouTube. So we're just going to keep uh, keep growing that. And then also our blog. So there's some new, uh, new blogs out uh, this season. Uh, if you want to learn about cost savings, that's an area we've been focusing on. You know, we want to make sure that we're helping brewers with, uh, you know, controlling their costs and being as efficient as possible with their yeast. So you can check that out as well. And if you liked this one, make sure you check out our other webinars. So we've got four more coming up in this series. Um, also a fifth that's going to drop 
uh, the day after Christmas, Boxing Day here in Canada. Um, so make sure you check those out, sign up for them. We're going to be talking about yeast versus hop creep, which is a very hot topic uh, with a lot of mystery. So I'm going to try to break that one down. Um, on the topic of breaking things down, or hopefully not breaking things down, we're going to be talking about foam and how do we actually maximize foam because no one wants no one wants a beer with no head. Um, and we're also going to be talking about controlling beer haze uh, because that's another hot topic. A lot of mystery there. We're going to try to break it down, um, use what we know, and, and help you with you know keeping your hazy beers hazy and your clear beers clear. Um, we're also going to talk about the modern IPA, which I think puts together some of these different topics. You know, where is the IPA headed? You know, what's West Coast? What's East Coast? What options and opportunities are coming up with new ingredients? And it's not just yeast. It's also things like advanced hop products and uh, new knowledge that's that's really helping to uh, revolutionize the IPA and keep it fresh. So I'm um, excited for that one as well. And that's it. I'm going to leave this slide up for a second because you can scan it uh, and access some of our educational resources. And I look forward to seeing you next time.